Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming this morning. Um, I welcome you to our second series of the four series um, wellness arthritis lectures with um, Dr. Jeffrey Wilson. Um, so welcome this morning, and I want to, of course, no introduction is needed, but let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Jeffrey Wilson. Thank you. Denise, I'm going to ask Denise to pass around something uh, I want you all to look at as it goes around and get an idea of what uh, strange things the rheumatologists say of, and, and the reason behind that. Also, I uh, found out that my excellent lab tech, Denise Temple and Gresham, somehow found our, our production last week on YouTube, sent it all around to uh, my office staff. I don't know how she did that, how she found that, but anyway, we have one to look extra sharp today uh, because it may be getting filmed and sent out, maybe going, <laughs> maybe going viral. July 1st, 1977, uh, I was approached by Jeff Crawford. It's the first day of fellowship in rheumatology. He said, I can't believe you're going into rheumatology. And I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, you know, you can't do anything for the patients. They're all whiny and, and griping patients. Uh, and it's just a depressing specialty. And what was he going into? Oncology. <laughs> I thought, when he tells you that, you really have to worry. But quite to the contrary, I had already run in at, at Duke to a patient, Harold F., uh, had a well-described thing of arthritis mutilans. That is a combination of rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis, so bad they had flail fingers, I mean totally unusable joints, horrible problem. Had a, a, a spleen about the size of a football that had to be taken out because of this felty syndrome, uh, which took his weight down to about 97 pounds, been sick and so on. What had he been doing? Working up until several weeks ago as a butcher to support his family. Incredible family, wife and, and daughter, always involving him in the decisions that were so important. And uh, those people sort of inspired me. Uh, and then my first, when I came to Lynchburg, my first uh, patient that had any Westminster Canterbury exposure to had come here from uh, Charleston, West Virginia. Husband was a judge. She had no relatives, no friends, no one that she knew here. And uh, she, her rest of her family was in Colorado, had no children. Ends up, with, like a lot of my West Virginia patients, we figure that we're all first cousins. Right, Bob? <laughs> Bob Glenn is. And uh, with that in mind, we sort of figured out probably the time we were in Charleston that she and the judge were playing bridge with my, my mom and dad, all sort of young couples getting together with bridge. With that in mind, we had her over at the house, and she sort of became sort of a, a house guest for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and different holidays since she was by herself. Wonderful. Uh, addition to the family. She was fiercely independent in her living. She had terrible, terrible arthritis, and if it were not for 24-7 uh, availability of a CNA, Edith, that she could not have been, done it, but she had that strong, independent living uh, feeling, which uh, we seen in Westminster Canterbury sometimes. Rheumatoid arthritis is sort of the main well-known arthritis behind rheumatology in general. And here we have the definition of systemic inflammatory autoimmune disorder of unknown etiology, chronic inflammation which causes joint destruction and disability. And I'll put a plug in for next week's talk on autoimmune disease. Have you seen the AARP? It has a nice article on when your, your own system automatically attacks you, the autoimmune diseases. They're increasing in frequency, going to be a real problem. The longer we live, the more chance we have of these things developing. And uh, it's, it's just a very interesting thing to consider. It gives us a, a, also a sort of pattern of, of how a lot of these diseases develop and, and how they all evolve from inherited susceptibilities, what things trigger them off, more and more things of environmental triggers. And that's the thing we wonder about with rheumatoid arthritis. What starts it? Was there an underlying infection sometimes that, that triggered off the susceptible immune system so it began to act against itself? Uh, environmental factors we'll talk about things we found out with related conditions, Agent Orange and its effect on connective tissue diseases like lupus. We'll talk about that in the future. They're, they used to think that trauma never really caused the onset of uh, arthritis, inflammatory arthritis. I think in some cases it does. Different things can trigger it off. The main thing that we, that we, we find is that the prevalence of seems to be going up, more common in females, age of onset 30 to 50 years of age. Uh, and the most common form of arthritis is osteo, not rheumatoid. Rheumatoid is the most common inflammatory arthritis. Remember, we all have somewhere in tear osteoarthritis. 
there's an inherited tendency for this. Patients who have these HLA uh, histocompatibility antigens, which we'll talk about in the future, DR4, DR14, DR1, they're the ones that tend to have increased incidence of rheumatoid arthritis and other connective tissue diseases in the family. One family member may have rheumatoid, another family member will have lupus, others may have overlapping conditions. Rheumatoid arthritis comes on gradually. It's not an overnight thing like some of the conditions we'll talk about in the future of polymyalgia rheumatica, gout, uh, temporal arteritis, those things that can come on almost suddenly, almost overnight. But rheumatoid is, is a gradual onset. We talk about morning stiffness as a sign of inflammation. And, the, uh, and we mean by more than, say, 60 minutes or so of stiffness until things loosen up as much as they will. Later on in the day, they may tighten back up again if you have a, a symmetrical inflammatory arthritis. <clears throat> we, oh, here we go. I'm sorry. <clears throat> this will be the part you'll have to beat on your quiz. The characteristic character cardinal signs of inflammation are Ruber, Kaler, Turger, Dolor, redness, heat, swelling, and pain. And it comes from a, an inflammatory cascade. The reason it's important to remember this, we're going to see how this fits into the problems with COVID now. It's one of the main causes of destruction and, and severe consequences of COVID disease. The inflammatory cascade, the, the whatever triggers, makes macrophages, T cells, and B cells, elements of the immune system, start to produce these things called cytokines. You'll hear a term of cytokine storm, something that related to COVID that's very severe and, and, and fatal conditions of COVID. These uh, cytokines are TNF-alpha, IL, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, JAK, Janus kinase caused, and all of these stimulate the agents in different cells that can destroy the joints, cause erosions in the joints, and so on. And the reason I list those, not for you so much to remember, but they're going to give us a clue as to different ways you can uh, treat with biologic agents and go after one of these elements of cytokines, control that, maybe help the arthritis. And maybe with COVID patients, you find one particular cytokine that seems to be driving the inflammation, treating that may, may save some lives as well. The DIP joints, distal interphalangeal joints we mentioned before, are not part of rheumatoid arthritis, part of osteoarthritis, and we listed the other ca causes of that. It does not affect the low back. So if you say, gee, I've got uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis in the low back, you don't. It's got, you may have a different type of inflammatory arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, but it's not rheumatoid. Most of the time, wear and tear, mechanical type problems in the back, the degenerative disc disease, which we all have. Anyone who gets taller as they get older has a, has a different disease. There's only, there's, there's only one condition that makes you get taller as you get older or get your, makes your joints enlarge as you get older, and that's acromegaly. You know, we have a, a brain tumor that, they, that, that causes an overgrowth, um, and, and you actually have, you see that every now and then. Being a systemic disease, the, um, it affects all different parts of the body differently. And eye problems, red eye problems, iritis, uveitis, things like that uh, can be uh, required the ophthalmologist to help out with their particular treatment. The lungs, interstitial fibrosis, uh, which can occur in a lot of different diseases, may occur with rheumatoid and some of its cousin conditions. Heart problems, usually pericarditis, inflammation around the heart, fluid around the heart, pleural effusions, fluids around the lungs. Blood problems, uh, anemia, People that have chronic, long-standing inflammation that has not been controlled may develop a thing called amyloidosis, and that's a, a particular problem. Saw that in a couple of a couple of patients, one of them, one of my West Virginia cousins, and uh, that ends up having treatment of things like bone marrow transplants, very uh, and stem cell transplants, big-time treatment, big problem. However, in general, with all the patients with inflammatory disorders there's an increased incidence of lymphomas. The reason that's important is if you hear the ads on TV about the different arthritis medicines, they go through everything saying how great it is, and then at the end they say, but it may cause, you know, have severe infections, cancers, 
lymphomas and so on. And uh, I had several patients who developed lymphomas and had they been on things like the biologic agents, Humira, Remicade and so on, they, should have, they certainly would have blamed the medicine, but it can be the disease itself. Skin problems, um, and, and this the little vial we're passing around, where is that now? Okay, have you all seen it yet? Hadn't been over here, has it been over here? Okay. The, um, one, of our, one of our people who, who will be a resident here soon, our dermatologist Janet Hickman, has uh, actually written textbooks, uh, chapters on pyoderma gangrenosum. Terrible sounding name, but it uh, can occur with inflammatory bowel diseases like ulcerative colitis, but also rheumatoid. And this patient, Grace Boyd, was in the hospital for about two and a half months trying to get this, this taken care of. It looks like, if you look at the legs, it looked like uh, this had been peeling off muscle and tissue all around the leg. Horrible, horrible uh, pyoderma gangrenosum. And if you biopsy it, it ends up with inflammation of the blood vessels. At that time, we had, again, few, few medicines that were being treated, but a new medicine at that time was, was penicillamine. The brand name was D-Pen. And what did you notice on the vial? Penicillin. So she went home from the hospital after two or two months having this stuff healed. Two or three weeks came back in. Her pharmacy filled a prescription for penicillin. They never heard of penicillamine. And it, it wasn't D-Pen. So we lost the whole of those two months. Forever after, whenever we'd write prescription, it kind of undermined penicillamine and, and make sure because you just always anticipate some of these newer things being messed up one way or the other. Nodules, lumps, and bumps around the joints, particularly around the elbows uh, of rheumatoid nodules are important because patients who have that end up having more severe rheumatoid, probably has a vasculitis basis. And we would, we would usually qualify our patients the same way they have erosive nodular rheumatoid, and that would tell us maybe more severe disease than someone with early onset a nodular uh, joint involvement. Feldy syndrome was a condition where you have recurrent infections, can't handle infections, splenal megaly. And this one particular patient, as I was talking about, uh, Harold F. at Duke, underwent surgery, had a spleen the size of a football taken out, big time surgery. And uh, again, the character of these people, I, was an in, I took care of them as a medical student, intern, resident, and a fellow, all that different admissions. Uh, and as an intern, you're chronically tired and uh, we were on five nights out of seven. I remember making rounds, and he had a complication following his splenomegaly of having a heart attack post-op. So going by one night, uh, about one or two in the morning, to see Harold, I said, you know, what's happening, how are you feeling? He said, well, he said, Dr. Wilson, I'm feeling a little bit better. He said, well, we're worried about you. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, we think that, you know, you're working so hard, we think you look tired. I said, well, I am tired. But the fact that, you know, all the things going on with him, terrible, terrible disease, just haven't had a heart attack, and he's worried about us. The uh, early onset of rheumatoid arthritis is most often in the hands, a symmetrical swelling of the MCP joints and the PIP joints. And if patients who present with lupus, scleroderma, uh, Sjogren syndrome, uh, dermatomyositis, all of them may present initially with just symmetrical polyarthritis like this. Later on, they define themselves as more of a rheumatoid or a scleroderma patient. What you want to do is obviously prevent the problem at the end, called derelict hands. You really, fortunately, particularly because of the biologic agents, don't see that as much now. The thing that worries me is that, uh, is, I think almost everyone agrees in rheumatology that the earlier you get on top of some of these things, the better. And so you see this thing in um, ads on TV, call your rheumatologist and, and say, you know, I think I'm, you know, have you considered Humira? Well, first of all, find a rheumatologist, call them, have them answer the call. And, uh, and you know, that may be the, the hardest part of it. But, but fortunately, we see fewer uh, changes like this. And there's a lot of surgery, hand surgery, very detailed surgeries that can help out with these, these folks as well.
And you can see on the right side the erosions and the changes in the bones there compared to the first figure. You know, until the end of 1940s, things were easier in rheumatology. There were only two kinds of arthritis, inflammatory arthritis and non-inflammatory. It's either rheumatoid or it's osteoarthritis. And treatment there was, was pretty, pretty basic. Uh, aspirin to get, to get levels that were anti-inflammatory. And you would follow salicylic uh, or levels in the blood, salicylate levels in the blood, trying to get levels like 16 to 18 milligrams per cent. That would require oh, sometimes 12, 14, 16 aspirin a day, can you imagine? And uh, so a lot of people did not tolerate that. The only remittive agent we had at that time were gold shots, real gold. No one could probably afford the gold now. And then Phil Hench made an incredible discovery in 1949, introduced steroids, prednisone, cortisol, uh, into rheumatology. And some people who had had uh, absolutely no relief for years overnight had some relief. It was a dramatic effect. And so uh, what was the, the action of the doctors? If a little's good, a whole lot's going to be a whole lot better. And in about two or three years, the, the sort of uh, the dictum was, you know, don't give your patients steroids. They don't know how to handle it. It wasn't the patients. We didn't know how to handle it. So for then for about 50 years, the question was, what's a low dose of prednisone? And there are, you know, reasonable low doses. Uh, and, you know, particularly uh, sometimes... Uh, you have a lot less uh, problems as far as side effects with people with low-dose prednisone uh, with their, with their uh, rheumatoid arthritis treatment. The next thing in general are the NSAIDs. NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, were taken as uh, um, in place of aspirin. Fewer that you had to take. All of them had still had a lot of GI upset problems. And then we had uh, two of them that came, uh, three of them that actually came out, Bextra, Vioxx, uh, and Celebrex, and the beauty of them was that they uh, they really were much easier on the stomach, much less tendency to cause ulcers. But somebody uh, said, "Wait a minute, these people these people that take this have increased heart problems, increased tendency to heart attacks." And the reason being, perhaps, that that uh, these did not affect the platelets, make them less coagulable, and, and so on. So it may have been some some information that was valid in that probably was, it was an over-exaggeration. So we lost Bextra and Vioxx. I had patients that, uh, that hoarded Vioxx. Uh, it worked so well for their arthritis and their pain. Uh, and we, we were so sad to see that medicine go in many ways. Celebrex is still the one that's easiest on the stomach. And guess what the number one factor is as far as stomach problems with, with NSAIDs? Like so many things, age. So when you, as you get older, you need the medicines more. You get the one factor that makes it harder for, you, for your system to tolerate it. Then came Plaquenil. Fascinating medicine. Hydroxychloroquine. They found out in World War II that people taking anti-malarial medicines, chloroquine and so on, had uh, improvement of their arthritis. And the, uh, how it worked, no one was, was exactly sure. Uh, but hydroxychloroquine is the derivative of Plaquenil. And we'll, we'll talk about that particularly with... Uh, with lupus. Uh, Michelle Petrie, who's sort of the guru for systemic lupus therapy in our country, says, I love Plaquenil and I hate prednisone. And we'll talk about how that balances out. Vitamin D and then, and then methotrexate. Methotrexate was the first big uh, breakthrough as far as uh, uh, remittive agents for rheumatoid arthritis before all the biologic agents came along. And the methotrexate um, when you're practicing, you know, clinical rheumatology, you're trying to, of course, stay on, on top of uh, how things are, are changing with, uh, uh, and being accepted in the academic fields. Academics are sometimes a little bit slower or, or, or maybe to get, get information out. At that time, the, the dictum was methotrexate, if you took it by mouth, by shot, by liquid by mouth, no matter what, the bioavailability was the same. And I had a young girl who uh, had come home from from camp in uh, North Carolina several years ago, and she was on the pediatric unit. She had uh, SED rates, you know, that were by, like 120, a lot of inflammation, fever every day, and to keep her fever down and control it, she was requiring you know, steroids, 
Um, and at this time, she was at that age, about 15 or 16, was it inflammatory juvenile arthritis, was it rheumatoid arthritis that was developing. And the, um, talking to a real rare rarity, a pediatric rheumatologist, try to find one of those, but a uh, wonderful guy, uh, and, and Harry helped me out, at, uh, out of Richmond, said, you, you know, we're trying intravenous gamma globulin. Intravenous gamma globulin for these, these patients at that time was totally experimental, so guess who didn't want to cover that? Insurance companies. And it would cost about every three or four weeks to cost like a new Mercedes. That was out. She'd been on gold, nothing. She'd been on methotrexate, the usual methotrexate by mouth, nothing. And we're a small, small group of rheumatologists in the country. We compared at that time to probably about five or 6,000 rheumatologists and about 30 or 50,000 cardiologists. And all VLC cardiologists know that apparently they're all about age 12, the youngest <laughs> group I've ever seen. But they uh, called Dave Brewer, who was a pediatric rheumatologist, and read an article of his, Arthritis and Rheumatism, our journal, and uh, looking at methotrexate in, in kids. So I called him. I said, you know, what about trying that? You always imagine this 15 or 16 year old, you know, taking a methotrexate is going to make bad effects forever. So we tried it by mouth. Nothing. Um, she, she would go home and I'd be getting calls all the time. Temperatures 40 degrees. We had so much Tylenol still on probably about 20, 25 milligrams of prednisone to keep her out of the hospital. And with the prednisone, 15, 16 years of age, you know, you're not very concerned about your, your appearance, right? Balloons up with the prednisone, you know, is weak and tired because of all the inflammation. You know, her socialization with her friends is just dreadful and terrible. So we decided to go ahead and give it to her by shot. Was she perhaps not absorbing the methotrexate? It was one of the thoughts we had. But she responded uh, in, in about uh, probably about four or five months. She was off prednisone, went into complete remission, ended up in the next a year or two later back on a volleyball team, playing with her girlfriends, ended up later on going to college, getting married, and so on. But I'll tell you, every time she'd get a fever, they'd shoot her to the office. <laughs> They did not want to mess and did not want to see this come back. Uh, so methotrexate was, was a real help, a real godsend. Then came the biologic agents. As you'll see, we, we outlined the different cytokine agents in the, in the cascade of inflammation. So we started off, the first ones were the anti-TNF agents, tumor necrosis factor agents. Humira, very popular. Remicade was the number one, was given by infusion, Embrel, uh, and so those were the anti-TNF agents first. So if you had a patient that it was a miraculous response in many patients, but not in all. And if someone didn't respond to it, we were happy to have some of these other agents that would work on a different part of the, the cytokine pathway. The interleukin-6 pathway could be interrupted by Actemra, tocilizumab, great names, Janus kinase inhibitor, Zeljans, Tofacitinib, anti-interleukin-1, Kinneret, and Akinra. Well, um, the most common side effect of these, I never had a patient you know, that developed cancer on them, had the terrible uh, brain problems that they talked about where some people could uh, uh, you know, have a real degenerative disease of the brain with it. Um, you know, never had that. The most common problem with those, those agents was poverty, and they're even more and more expensive. I did an article the other day from our Lamlight, our Academy of Medicine newsletter by Jim Wright, looking at the, the prices of things. Good grief. You know, here patent medicines have been here, Humira, for 15 or 20 years. You know, they have generics available, so what's happened to the price? Gone higher and higher. Uh, so it's ridiculous. We really have to have attention to that. Some patients who don't respond, respond to Rituxan injectable medicine. It works on, on different parts of the immune system, the B cells. Orencia, a very special agent, had one patient that the absolute, she'd gone through all the medicines, the only one that worked was Orencia. And her, when the hospital uh, uh, bought out the, the, the PHO, they boosted up her copay so that she couldn't afford that one medicine that worked for her anymore. Um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, surgery, all sort of things are modalities of treatment for the rheumatoid arthritis. The rheumatoid arthritis blood test, just like the, we're going to be really spend a lot of time with the ANA test, the loop, presumed lupus test next time, because these things are, are fascinating. 
first of all, the rheumatoid factor is, you talk about an autoantibody, it's an anti-antibody antibody. That is, so, say it's, it works against the IgG antibodies, the IgM antibody that you know, reacts against the IgG antibodies in the patient. So that is autoimmune. And it's a very sensitive test. There are other diseases that, that cause the rheumatoid factor to be, be positive. Infectious disorders, <clears throat> bacterial endocarditis, TB, mono, chronic hepatitis, leprosy, malarial, Whipple's disease, unusual things may have a positive rheumatoid factor as well. The uh, patients, you know, just with aging, good news for all of us, really th people think if we live long enough, we're all going to have autoimmune disease or at least have these autoantibodies. And it would be interesting to see, you know, if, if we had screens just, you know, as time goes by because different things will be showing up. Whether it means you've got any, a, a clinical disease related to it, I don't know. But the, the antibodies are probably not the, the best sign, just to not have those. The uh, connective tissue disorders, almost all of them, which we'll talk about next time, are cousin conditions, lupus at end, uh, one end, rheumatoid at the other. And in between Sjogren's, scleroderma, dermatomyositis, all of those patients, about 30% of them will have positive rheumatoid factors. A more specific uh, test is the anti-cyclic citrullinated <laughs> epeptide antibodies. That's why I call it ACCP. It's more specific for rheumatoid and less, less sensitive. So again, ways to, to, to diagnose it. The, um, particularly with, with things being so difficult in treating some patients, we, we got interested in other things that may be useful in treating arthritis in general. And uh, you have a handout on complementary and alternative therapy. Before you get into that, do you have any particular questions on the rheumatoid? Everything's pretty clear. <laughs> you know, it's amazing to, um, when we had patients just on aspirin, to, to get them to take, uh, you know, 16 aspirin a day. But, you know, if your rheumatoid is bad enough, you, you would do it. It was uh, incredible. Prednisone, low doses, and probably a low dose ended up being like less than 6 milligrams a day in the morning, not at night less, less uh, side effects from that. To be tolerated was, was so cheap. Um, other cheap medicines we'll talk about in another lecture is medicines like colchicine, that once the FDA got hold of that, they uh, turned that into a terribly expensive medicine uh, because of basically government intervention. But complementary and alternative therapy. Anybody remember Tom Jones, his pharmacy, Boonesboro? What an individual, what a unique, unique situation. I've never known a pharmacy like that since, for sure. And um, at Tom Jones, I'd come home for vacation, I'd have, you know, things on the, on the uh, phone, just uh, messages, and I'd say, uh, you know, hey, Dr. Jeff, this is Tom, so-and-so called, she was, you know, you know, out of her methotrexate, I knew he'd want her to have it, so I went ahead and refilled it. <laughs> and he was always right. And if a patient needed, you know, medicine at two in the morning, they called, Tom came down from the mountain and took care of them. Totally unique. Uh, my mother-in-law, who referred to Lynchburg before we moved here as that stagnant little Virginia town, wanted us to go to Charlotte. Um, she'd come here and, and love Tom Jones. She could find stuff at Tom Jones Pharmacy she couldn't find in Charlotte. Come on now. And, uh, and so she loved Tom Jones, we all did. Um, uh, I had, the only problem I had him one time was when he opened up his store uh, started to expand a little bit, I think, out in the forest. And there was this ad on TV, uh, uh, somebody saying, interviewing Tom, saying, well, Tom, are, are there any good treatments for arthritis? He said, well, you know, I said a lot of people are finding this garlic is really helpful. And garlic seems to help garlic pills. So I, I, the next time I got on the phone, he said, how are you doing, Dr. Jeff? Not too good, Tom. You're going to have to give me a job. I said, I'm out of work. No one has arthritis now because of your damn garlic pills. Also at that time, a very popular thing was DMSO, which is a great agent for vehicle for getting things in. And, and the neat thing about DMSO, you could not do uh, a double blind study because it produced a garlic taste. So you couldn't you know, have somebody you know, do it. And then later on, it kind of fell out of favor, but it sure was popular then. Um, and some things started with willow bark. And what happened you know, with Indians chewing willow bark? No, know what it had in it? Yeah, aspirin. How about that? 
good old things. And we have, uh, you know, we're going to take a look at some elements called the various supplements that are, that are looked at and you may have heard about. Glucosamine, falling behind there, huh? Glucosamine, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, slowly in cartilage loss. Chondroitin made from animal cartilage. People with alpha-gal would have problems with that. Collagen booster. Fish oil capsules, metabolism to cause anti-inflammatory agents called resolvins. Methylsulfonyl, methanine, MSM, sulfur in connective tissue. People taking 1,000 to 3,000 milligrams a day. Vitamin D to decrease pain. Turmeric. Spice, anti-inflammatory, causing less pain. Things I haven't heard of, borage oil, plant extract, increased gamma linoleic acid, anti-inflammatory, SAME, S-adenosyl methionine, liver metabolism, equivalent to ibuprofen, naproxen, cartilage repair and, and protection. Boswellia, hadn't heard of that one. Plant extracts, slowing cartilage loss. Cat's claw, like that name, Uncaria tomentosa, woody vine central in South Africa. Tannins in it for osteoarthritis and rheumatoid, presumably helpful. Avocado soybean, like that one. Unsepaphonico, sepaphonic feebles. Hmm. Protect synovial cells, healthy connective tissue, osteoarthritis, pain relief. And you avoid, uh, due to liver toxicity, thunder god vine, chaparral, amica, and kambuka tea, which People will be sorry about it. I know some people like that. Then we had recent discussion about herbs and productions. I think I med, uh, med uh, RX on, on the internet. Different herbs to use with caution because of drug interactions, blood pressure effects, and blood clotting problems. And these include things like St. John's wort, cava causing hepatitis, ginkgo could affect blood thinners, arnica uh, increase the blood pressure, coma problems, ginger, popular, Blood clotting, hypertension, blood sugar, and arrhythmias. Golden seal, hypertension, arrhythmias. Aloe, heart, kidney, diabetes. Ephedra, Chinese tea, hypertension. Ginseng, popular, may cause decreased blood pressure, affect blood thinners. Black cohosh, very popular, remember going through menopause, may have liver toxicity. Garlic, thinning the blood. Licorice root, increases the blood pressure. Stinging nettle, heart and kidney problems. Fafra, I'm going to show up that word for migraine, affecting blood clotting. All these from WebMD. And so all of these were things that were reasonable for people to try. And I think most of the time, if they didn't cause any harm, it didn't bother me for them to try that. And in, in looking at other things that uh, we kind of, kind of look at and think about, uh, acupuncture has that been helpful in some people. It certainly has in some. And, uh, and again, I don't think it's dangerous. And then I wanted to uh, have my, my neighbor, Cremora, uh, talk about a magnet therapy. Magnet therapy, some people have tried for different things. Cremora, tell us what you found. Uh, I used to have really bad fibromyalgia in 1989 and went to the doctors and nobody had any solutions and they told me to go to the library and get a book on fibrositis and find out about that because that was what they called it back then. And I figured if they didn't know what to do, I sure didn't know what to do. So I just kind of kept exploring. And I had a friend that had fibromyalgia and had used Niken magnetic products and I decided what the heck, I may as well try them. So I s currently even still sleep on a bed of magnets and I wear, sometimes I wear a magnet on my back all the time playing golf and stuff. So it doesn't hurt, you know, it's just uh, an alternative. And when my shoulders used to be really bad, and my arms, I was really bad. I mean, I couldn't even walk with my arms hanging down. It's just really hard to believe now how bad off I was. But, you know, using that in far infrared energy, it's a Japanese company and it's Far Eastern medicine. So it's just a different way of looking at things. And that's what they do. So I found it really made a big difference for me. I, I'm running around like a little energizer bunny. 
anybody else who's had experiences with any, the, the amount of money that's spent on complementary and alternative therapies you know, is significant. And a lot of times when uh, you're going through the uh, history with the patient, they don't, they th don't think to you know, add that as part of their parathyroid therapy to be considered. Well, one of the things I think is interesting is as we learn more things, was particularly how all of all this, this information, particularly about inflammation, relate to the COVID-19, long haulers problems, chronic fatigue syndrome, and fibromyalgia. We've really, in the past, you know, with chronic fatigue syndrome and, and fibromyalgia, have not had any definite causes that we knew about. But uh, I, I'm wondering in about 20 years from now, what we're going to say, we're going to say that these young people said, well, I had a light case of COVID-19. Yeah, 20 years later, what have you got? You know, are these people that are having some sort of problems like chronic fatigue? Uh, and I, I wonder if there's a mechanism that maybe that started these things, disorders in people, chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. Infectious agents to me would certainly seem possible in, in the past. The, uh, and right now, I guess the feeling is with, if with early COVID infection, and maybe then's the time to use antiviral agents, and we've seen some of those written about. Uh, however, after that, the next se section of our people getting into to hyperinflammatory response, and that's when we want to probably intervene with some of the biologic agents, and uh, particularly the interleukin uh, agents. So, and, and some of these people, they can measure increases in the uh, cytokines and say, okay, your COVID right now seems to be hyperinflammatory, maybe because of more interleukin-6, we're going to use the Actemra medicine in this patient. So we're getting a little smarter on, the, on these, these type of things, that, and how it's important with COVID now. Um, the, 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 one, the other thing that's ever happened is the long hauler disease. You all familiar with that with COVID patients? And I was called by one of my uh, ex-patients about her daughter-in-law, who the family went through and had, had basic COVID son husband and the wife, and hers continued with symptoms, terrible fatigue and terrible pain. Uh, and she has had, uh, took, took the took vaccine after that. Some people seem to get better after the vaccination. This was before, before, had a vaccination after that. It seemed to do, do worse. Um, and people are doing a lot of studies, but one of the things they're doing is to identify in some of the long hauler folks, again, these cytokines, one that's particularly elevated they, that they'll, they'll go ahead and use an anti-TNF agent if the TNF is elevated, if that's their cytokine that's elevated, an anti-interleukin agent if that's the thing that's elevated. Uh, but, but these are, are terrible problems in these folks, and they really bring to mind, again, the fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. So I think we're, we're, we're learning some uh, probably valuable lessons but hard things to learn from the COVID infection. I think it will be important for the folks in the future. Uh, and I'm going to open up for any, any sort of questions in general. Well, I think the vitamin D, which is tremendously important, uh, is, is the thing that, that helps modify the immune system. So it says, you know, inflammatory immune system modulator so it doesn't overreact or underreact. Your immune system has got to be handling infections but not overreacting. So it seems to keep these people from getting into the hyperinflammatory response. And I think that was a, a big difference. As you know, we had a um, subset of people with COVID that they identified. Um, this subset had a one particular genetic locus with several different factors, P4, CC, whatever plus they, were, they had a, the ABO blood group. The people with that group were the ones that really got into trouble with the COVID, ended up on high mortality on the respirators. And this, these are the folks that, number one, you, know, you wanted them to have vaccines as early as you could. If not, if they got the disease, you really wanted the dexamethasone as soon as you could uh, and, and, and the vitamin D. And the, that, that was a subgroup. That, that they, and I think we'll they identify more and more subgroups in COVID and probably subgroups and all these other things like rheumatoid. I think you know, this subgroup is going to respond a lot better to Humira, one another subgroup to methotrexate. But I think that the mechanism of vitamin D, I think, is to modulate the immune system. There are two home remedies that I'm familiar with for arthritis, and one is the gin soap raisins. 
Ah. And uh, you use golden raisins with gin, and you let them sit for a week or so, and then you eat nine a day. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know why nine, but that's what they say, nine a day. And then the other one is Serto in grape juice. Take a packet of the uh, Serto, pour it into a half gallon of grape juice, and drink anywhere from four to eight ounces a day. Serto and Serto is a liquid pectin that you would make jam and jellies out of. And you put it in your grape juice, shake it up, and drink it every day. And it's supposed to, it's a home remedy. Um, there's just testimonials on whether it works or not, uh, they oh, sure. work or not. So, uh, anyway. I wonder I'll if it's the alpha gal problem. Well, with the pecto, with the Serto, yeah. yes. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and, and that's just for general arthritis or specifically for? Well, I think it's more for osteo yeah. arthritis. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody think the weather affects their arthritis? No doubt about it. That the barometric change, that was well proven. Uh, a guy, Joe Hollander, who was the, uh, one of the godfathers of rheumatology, did the test when they had patients that would be in a in closed rooms, couldn't see the weather changes, barometric changes they could handle. And, and sure enough, and you could even measure changes with, uh, with little transducers, so on in the joints of barometric changes of, of tightening of the, the synovial fluid in the joint. Um, so that's, that's, that's true. You're better weathermen than some of them, not than George Flickinger, much better. Jeff, is there any real hard evidence that the glucosamine and chondroitin, those things really work uh, to either improve cartilage or to replace cartilage or to minimize its loss? Maybe the last part, there may be some. And, then, and they did it uh, by doing, say, people stand the x-ray of the knees and, you know, following over a period of time, you know, and they seem to, to slow down the decrease, but it really didn't build it up. And, you know, as far as, like, uh, treatments for osteoarthritis and, and the knees, sometimes the Best way to find out is any anti-inflammatory going to make a difference. Your doctor gives you that cortisone injection. You can't get more concentrated inflammatory medicine locally than an injection like that. If it really does nothing, then that, that to me suggests that uh, you're, you're going to have problems. Maybe you're heading toward the surgeon. And we know about use, using topical non like Voltaren. Um, those sort of things are, are worth tries, but um, no, no great evidence about that. The uh, Synvisc, some of the uh, visco supplementation where they inject this high algin, hyaluronic acid uh, derivatives that, uh, that may help some people for like, you know, for months. Everyone's sort of different with how, how they respond to it. Sometimes that's, that's uh, worth a try before surgery, and some people just aren't candidates for surgery. Excellent, yeah. and uh, you know there are no doctors in my family. So, um, but I have some great storytellers, and the best one is Aunt Ruth. And uh, you know Aunt Ruth, you know, would start off saying, "I know what you doctors say," but, and then here's the truth. And uh, by the time she finished, I'd be taking ginger or, or you know, uh, you know, putting uh, Crystal Lake water on my head for any, prevent baldness. I was bald, but you know, it was, so it works. Interesting. <laughs> and and yeah, you know, I always like to pick up information. Uh, so any anything else that y'all have tried, or any other questions about that? I'd say the overall yes. Coming back to the GMS house, I worked. I worked for a group of urologists for a long time. We gave bladder installations for interstitial cystitis right. with DMSO, which was originally for horses with rheumatitis. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and and very good agent. That, when y'all were using that, you know, in the bladder, were you putting medicine in with it so that it was a vehicle that carried more medicine in, in with into the bladder, interstitial cystitis, or the DMSO by itself? By itself. 
by itself. Okay. Yeah. I thought a great one was. Uh, away smelling pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to go to the Italian restaurant that night. Um, The uh, DMSO was very popular when I, when I you know, started here. And then Western Ways, you remember when you used to head toward Bedford, the only the store out there was Western Ways on, on the way up. Boy, I wish I would bought all that, man. But um, so Western Ways had DMSO, and, and you know, patients would, would swear by it. And, and the other thing was a jogger and a jug. Oh, I thought that was great. I wish, why did I invent that? I had a great idea. It's going to be a, a jogger and a mug. And it's going to have a jogger going to, where you put your hands around a mug that's warm, so you have that warmth on your hand, kind of like paraffin baths. The other things that made the joints feel better. Every, you know, everybody has you know, got great ideas to help. I think the ginger, in your case, great idea. So anything else? What other real, what are the wildest things some of you have tried? Come on. Yes, Sue. Are there any long-term bad effects from the biologics? Well, you know, that was one of the things I worried about when they started. You know, I, we were doing so well the we combined methotrexate and vitamin D that we had lots of people that were, and, and the Plaquenil, that were getting, you know, off on methotrexate, off their prednisone, and maintaining them with vitamin D and, and maybe low-dose Plaquenil. So, so I was sort of slow to go into to biologics. My fear, fear being that, you know, 20 years after the biologics, then would you start seeing patients say more in, in, increased instances of lymphomas themselves or tumors? I just didn't know. It kind of it kind of bothered me. I think it's fascinating that the uh, when the COVID stuff started, I just assumed that our all of our rheumatoid patients on the biologics were in big trouble. I thought, you know, they're they're immune compromised. They're more likely to have severe COVID, uh, and yet that, that's not been the case. Not, not so bad. Uh, one article came out today, you know, with some lupus patients having maybe some increased mor morbidity, mortality. But I thought it was going to be much worse. Uh, and again, maybe it's because part of the hyperinflammatory response involves the, the places these biologic agents are acting. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a curse of interesting times, right? The Chinese curse of interesting times. Ah, you know, that's interesting. <laughs> Heard it all, and uh, Sandra and I, for about 25 years, went down to Polly's Island every every year, and it was the same bunch of people that were there. And went down there one time. And I thought, well, my goodness, this here's a guy from Lynchburg, and I've seen him as a patient. And uh, you know, I came up there and said, hey, how are you doing? He said, he said, it's fine. You know, you didn't do anything for me, but you know, I was out in the garden. I got this bee sting, and my arthritis went away. <laughs> and I thought, holy mackerel. Well, at that time. Uh, it, we had a farmer you know, who had his bees, and, and people and friends were coming out to him and getting bee stings. So it may be that little burst of, of uh, you know, epinephrine or whatever to get with a bee sting, but, uh, but I've heard that. And funny reactions people have. I had a, a lady with, uh, uh, she was my secretary's mother, rheumatoid arthritis, gave her first test dose of gold. Test dose of gold was like five milligrams, usual dose is 50 milligrams working up to a thousand to a thousand milligrams total and she came in the day after her shot and she it looked like she had developed mono overnight swollen glands febrile sick as a dog liver function test abnormal test dose of gold and i thought holy mackerel i've killed her and um, uh, but all of a sudden her arthritis which was significant rheumatoid went to complete remission for about two years i mean complete so something stunned that immune system and said look you know, behave, or, you know, this is what you get. Um, and hers uh, went away. That, then guess what? Two or three years later, it started to come back. You know what she wanted? Another shot of that gold. It's like, <laughs> can't do that. It killed kill me, I worry, or us both. Um, and, and again, those, those are the things that stick in your mind and, I, and I have, you know, certainly some, some importance to it. Okay, well, no other questions. I've got a question that might be a little related. Um, I've got two different friends that are airline pilots. In the last couple of months, each one of them came down with COVID. 
I think one did iver ivermectin and one got on hydrochlorophen and they were back on flying status within a week, both of them. Isn't that interesting? And, you know, as far as, as, as any follow-up and research on that, people say, well, they don't work. Um, and if I were those guys, I'd say it works. And probably if you knew them and all of a sudden you get it, you'd be inclined to try it. The, um, the little girl I've talked about, my patient's daughter-in-law, uh, I stay in contact with, she tried, tried that in Beckman, the hydroxychloroquine. The main problem with hydroxychloroquine was all of a sudden there's, there's a shortage of supply for the people with lupus and so on that, that absolutely need it. Um, and, and we know that Plaquenil has just been an interesting medicine. Worried thing, worried about ocular toxicity and the, the, the eye folks, I don't know if you ever, my eye doctor, every time I go to my eye doctor, he has the newest machines. They've always got a new gadget and they have more and more sensitive things for picking up any sudden changes or subtle changes in the, uh, in the back part of the retina. Uh, so much is so sensitive that, that all of a sudden you know, they showed back up in your office saying, gee, the eye doctor said to stop the Plaquenil. I said, well, well good, what did he put you on? He said, for you to see you. So they, they you know, tie your hand behind your back and say, take, take over. <laughs> um, now, Michelle Petrie, who's the guru of, of lupus uh, at Johns Hopkins, about the first couple of times that uh, the eye doctor stopped the plaque window without talking to her ahead of time, they got a, a real strong feedback from her uh, because that medicine was so important to them. She, she feels like, and so the real gurus of lupus, that it's like the daily vitamin, so, so important. Um, and we know that uh, if it's stopped, there's nothing quite to substitute. Now they have blood levels they can check for the plaque windows. They can actually, you know, I think really uh, control with much less tendency to toxicity. I had one patient that had uh, retinal toxicity from plaque in 35 years. And if you remember when it came out and uh, uh, early on the Chinese and everybody were using it, they said, oh, the, the problem is uh, it increases heart disease, heart problems, arrhythmias. Never saw that. Uh, it was usually the ocular toxicity. Any other questions? Okay. Denise, you have the quiz. Pass out the quiz. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. And this will this is being recorded, um, so you will see it on the resident website under the resident life and wellness section. Um, and we will also have handouts, copies of the handouts in the fitness center as you walk in the door in that little um, slots there. If you're if you know anybody that wants those as well. And thank you again, and we will have two more in September coming up. So we hope to see you then.